You know, so it's like this, you know, the Gemara says that, that the name of the mountain that the Torah was given on was Sinai, right? Sinai. So the Gemara, in fact, says that the truth is the name, that name Sinai wasn't really its, uh, its given name, you know. The, the older name of the mountain was the Mount of Chorev. was given the name Sinai sort of as a nickname when Kabbalah Satara happened. Why? So the Gemara says, because the word Sinai, even though it's spelled with a sin, you could play, you could play with it like it's, uh, it's spelled with a salach, but you can play with it like it's spelled with a sin. And it's, it comes from the word sin, which means hatred. Where it says that when the, we got the Torah, mimenu yarda sin olam, that the hatred of the nations of the world against the Jewish people took place at the giving of the Torah. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's where our issues come from. Now what's interesting is that you have to understand in Chazal, whenever Chazal says something, you have to understand that, that they're not just telling you just the words. There, there's something, there's a deeper message that's being, that's, that's being transmitted or trying to be transmitted. Whenever the Gemara talks about the nations of the world, the nations of the world don't just mean the nations of the world. It means the Yitzhar as well. For example, the Gemara says that, that uh, one of the tefillahs that one of the Amarayim used to say after Shemonesri every day was, we want to do your will, and who's holding us back from really becoming tzaddikim is is O Malchus, is the the nations of the world, the Sar Shabis and the Eight Sahara. Means they're they're bound together. They're one and the same. Every Eight Sahara, every nation, sort of is the embodiment of a particular Eight Sahara. So, for example, when Davin Melech is fighting his wars against the Gaim, right? Davin Melech is fighting his wars against the Gaim, and he's he's davening to him at the same time. David Melch understood that his physical war against an enemy was just a reflection of an inner war that's going to be between him and his Yitzhahara. So when the Gemara says, let's go back, so when the Gemara says that by Har Sinai, that was a moment in which the nations of the world began its assault against the Jewish people, and we became the target and the enemy, that means that's also the moment when the Yitzhahara and just uh, all the temptations of life, ah. Uh, Ah, uh, so that when all the temptations of life began to attack the Jewish people as well. So let's understand why that is. Like what, so w- this idea that the Jewish people in particular are the most susceptible to attack of the Eight Sahara, which is very ironic. It's very ironic. The Gemara says, for example, such a line. The Gemara says it clearly that the Eight Sahara says, the Gemara quotes the Eight Sahara, the Eight Sahara says, Meniach ani kol I'm going to, I'm not going to waste my energy with the nations of the world attacking them. Umazgar bistro, I'm going to attack the Jewish people. That's the Eight Sahara says. So, in that moment of when we like got into his, uh, you know, the radar, uh, the crosshairs, you know, that happened by Har Sinai. So fine, we usually tend to think of that as like a terrible, like it's a negative, it's like a, no, what can we do? It's a negative side effect of being the chosen people that everyone, you know, now, now we're in everyone's scopes. But let's understand on a deeper level some, an actual, an actual positive side of that, because we have to think of it, why would you give the name of Har Sinai to such a negative connotation. Like, you, you're, the mountain that the Torah was given on, I understand that a side effect is, and now we're in a, the, the crosshairs, and everyone, uh, we're under attack from the Yitzhar and the Umas Ha'olam, but that, that, you're going to call the, na- the name of the mountain by that? Like, uh, so it's like this. I literally just saw this on my way here. I had some extra time in the Uber because there was traffic. So uh, I saw it from the Balatanya. Okay, so I'm going to share with you something we find from the Balatanya. Now, Chazal say that when the giving of the Torah took place, Hashem Yisparach, uh, you know, he said, you know, the, 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 there was coils of, of rockim, there was thunder, and there was n- the sa- sound of Hashem, and he sa- Hashem said, I am Hashem your God, you shall not have any other gods. And the Gemara says, Kol God of Eliyasev, that this voice of Hashem was so powerful that it kept on going, it didn't create any echoes. There was no echoes. Chazal says such a thing. Yosef, there was no Kol Maisif, there was no echoes back. All right. So the, the Sarm Hashem asks, like Hashem does miracles for a reason. He's not going to go out of his way to make a miracle that's useless and pointless. So there's a miracle happening over here, right? That Hashem's voice that came off the mountain and all the thunder and so on it didn't create an echo, which is not normal, right? Usually sounds create an echo. So why is Hashem making this miracle? What's the point of this? The explanation is as follows. What causes an echo? Okay, and this is, this is fundamental to understand what Yiddish guy really is about. What, what causes an echo? What causes an echo is that I say something, right? Vibrations come out of my mouth. That's the words. And it's traveling, it's traveling, it's traveling. Hits a wall. The wall is not my voice. 
the, the voice, therefore, ha- is, is the wall is stronger. The voice bounces back. That's an echo. It's echoes. The reason why Hashem's voice didn't create an echo is because what was revealed at Har Sinai was that everything is Hashem's voice. When the voice of Hashem, so to speak, came out of the mountain and hit a mountain, right? It hit a mountain. So usually that voice would bounce off the mountain and create an echo. The reason why it didn't is because as that voice, so to speak, was traveling through the world, it was converting everything it touched into itself. It was revealing the deeper truth of all things, which is that what is a mountain? A mountain is also nothing more than Hashem's word. When Hashem said in the beginning of creation, let there be a mountain, then that word becomes a physical mountain. What happened on our Sinai was just revealing the deeper truth of all of physical reality. All physical reality is also the words of Hashem. Give me an example. I was learning this with, with, um, with um, someone from the shul last night, and it's interesting. Chazal talk about that we have this, this, uh, this, this parak, this, this in, Tana, in Chazal, it's called Parak Shira. You know what Parak Shira is, right? What's Parak Shira? It's a collection of Psukim and Tehillim, right? That corresponds to different animals and different things. And it says, like, you know, uh, the, the birds say this Pasuk, and ants say that Pasuk, and mountains and, and wind, all these things. You know, what's amazing is, Chazal say unbelievable things about someone who says Perak Shira. Chazal say, you say Perak Shira, then you're guaranteed Olam Haba, Perak Shira is greater than Tehillim. It's like unbelievable things about Perak Shira. What's, uh, what is that? Like, what, what, is, what is it that the ants say this Pasuk? So on a simple level, probably what most people think is, what it means is, not that the ant is saying a Pasuk until the ant is an ant. But we know that everything has a Malach in charge of it, and the Malach in charge of the ants say this Pasuk. But I saw from the Leshem last night, the Leshem says not like that. The Leshem says it's not the Pshat. Pshat is what is an ant? So we think of an ant. An ant is an ant. Of course, there's a Malach in charge of it. No, no, no. You know what an ant is? An ant is a Pasuk Tilam. Perak Shira is revealing the deeper truth of what an ant is. What is a cockroach? What's a bird? What's a mountain? What's a river? What's grass? What's the wind? It's not the Pshat these things exist and it happens to be there's Malachim in charge or whatnot. No, no, no. The, the Perak Shira is revealing the inner dimension of what everything is. And therefore, Chazal say there's nothing greater than a Jew that's involved in Perak Shira. Because what's Perak Shira? Perak Shira is a revelation of what? Enam Movada, that there's nothing but the Rabbanish Shalom. Everything, everything is the Dvar Hashem. When the, when the voice of Hashem emanated from Harsina, there was no echo because there was nothing else but the Dvar Hashem. There was nothing standing in its way to bounce off of it. Everything was converted into that single truth of the Rabbanish Shalom. That's what happened in Harsina. Now, ever since that moment, so what, that revelation of Harsina takes place. And then what happens? Our scene is done, you know, the uh, special effects end, and now back to the world that we lived in before, which is, an ant looks like an ant. But ever since that month of Har Sinai, the Jewish people were given a mission, and given a task, which is to reveal that an ant is not an ant. Reveal that everything of this world is part of that spirit of Hashem, part of that wind of Hashem, part of that Devar Hashem. Not only, now here's the kicker, not only is this our responsibility, not only is this something that the Jewish soul desperately wants to reveal, which is what reality truly is, but reality itself also wants to be, wants to be uh, set free. You know, that moment, of, you have to think about it. Imagine an ant is really a Pasuk Telem. The ant is going through its whole life, mamish, uh, like uh, being, st- being, being locked up in a cage of, of not being able to really express its true identity, of always going in costume. The moment of our Sinai was not just a simcha for Hashem. It wasn't just a simcha for the Jewish people. It was a simcha for the ants. It was a simcha for the grasshoppers, for the mountains, for the grasses. Because everything was finally able to express what it really is, which is the Devar Hashem. Ever since that moment, not only is this something that we're craving to do deep down, but the world itself is craving for that moment of being able to take off the veil and say, this is who I am. The whole world wants to j- just express the truth of, of, of Perak Shira. Therefore, says the Baltanya, because of that, because of that moment of Harsinai, where now everything in Olam Hazah wants desperately to be, to, to be unleashed and to be uh, revealed as to what it is, whenever there's a Jew, all of a sudden everything of this world tries to cling to that Jew. And therefore, we experience it as if we're being attacked by this world. And we're being attacked by everything that's unholy. But the truth is, it's not attack. What's really happening is, is that everything is asking for help. 
Valtani says an amazing thing. He says, why is it that Davka, when a Jew opens up a Sefer to learn, or you open up a Siddur to Davin, all of a sudden, things enter your brain, distractions come to your brain, things that you don't even want to think about. It's not like things that you, that you really want to think about and you're trying to push away. You don't want to think about these things, right? Things that come to your brain are the stresses about work or stresses about family or, 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 or things that are unholy. It's not like you were, you were trying to... It, it's not like these things were, were, were in your brain and you're trying to get rid of them. Like they weren't there. And all of a sudden I open up the sitter and all these thoughts come to me. So we tend to think of that. It means that I'm being attacked by the Eighth Zahar. So the Tanya, you're not being attacked. These are thoughts that are looking to be helped. They want to, they finally see a Jew, oh, he's opening up a safer. Maybe, maybe somehow I'll be able to, to be part of that experience. Maybe somehow we'll be able to have a Harsini again and it will be revealed that all these, all these uh, things are this world. There's all the Dvar Hashem. So they all, they're looking for Yidin to hold on to. That's what, and therefore the Yid feels like he's being attacked, like there's such a, like all, all of a sudden there's a huge burden on him. And what the Jew wants to do is just to get rid of that. But the Yid has to realize, that, no, 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 all these extraneous thoughts and all these balagans that, that come to a Yid, Davka, when you're trying to do a mitzvah, don't think of it as an enemy. Think of it as things of this world that, are, that, that want to be mishtatev in your mitzvah, that want to be rescued by you. How do you rescue them? So you rescue them by, by not, not allowing those thoughts to just be by themselves to focus your attention on the Gemara, to focus your attention on the Sefer, focus your attention on the davening, and not to allow those thoughts to take you away from this. They're quite the opposite. Realize that those thoughts, what they're really asking you is to daven harder. That's what they really are asking for you. Because those thoughts are, it's reality. You know, let's say a person is about to daven, right? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, like, uh, comes into the brain a conversation you had a few hours ago with a coworker or something. And like you're thinking to yourself, why in the world? Why is my brain going to? I don't, like, I, I, why am I thinking about that now? The answer is because that conversation is stuck in exile. That that experience of you and your coworker from a few hours before is stuck in Gullahs. It looks like just a, a simple conversation between two human beings, but the truth is, it, the, there's there's the, there's a Devar Hashem that's stuck in that conversation, and it's looking to be released. That's why that conversation sort of reemerges and reappears in your life when you're about to die. Because you're, what, what's happening is that that conversation is asking for help. It's asking, Davin, with me in mind. Davin, that, that, Davin and, and when you reveal the truth in your own life through Davening, I, maybe I'll be able to be revealed also as, as, as something that's real. So your avoda then is not to be frustrated by it and not to, not to look down at yourself like, oh, what type of person am I that I have such thoughts coming to me? Quite the opposite. Your avoda is, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to what these thoughts are trying to get me to do, which is not to be distracted, quite the opposite. They want you to focus in davening. They're asking you to focus harder. They just want to be involved. They just want to be part of it. You know, there are people like this, right? There are some people that they're not necessarily holding by, by learning, right? Or they're not holding by davening, but at least to be amongst other people that are davening and learning. You know, they say a story, this is uh, from Shlomo Freifeld. Right? So he started uh, Shoyashiv, right? So there's a story, I remember in the biography, that there was a bunch of Bachrim, or I don't know, I guess they were Bachrim, whatever it is, that they were in, in the yeshiva. They were, like, I guess, officially in the yeshiva. They weren't really, you know, doing much in the yeshiva. And so, and so maybe one of the Rebbeim or someone asked Rabbi Freifeld, like, maybe if they're schmoozing all day, maybe they should schmooze, like, in the dorm or something. They shouldn't be in the basement. So Rabbi Freifeld said quite the opposite. They... They want to be in the basement. Like it, it, let let the, they can learn. They're not holding by that by that place, but at least they should be in an, in 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 a, in a base medrash where other people are learning. They shouldn't distract them, but but at least to sort of be in that environment and they'll be uplifted by it. They're, they're deep in in, in, in in a certain sense. They're they're they want to learn and they're trying to connect to that learning. They just don't know how, and so in a certain sense, what they're really asking for of everyone else in the base medrash is learn and have us in mind. That's really what they're asking. And so this is what's going on. Well, Tani gives a mushal, he says, for example. Let's say you're sitting, right? And, uh, and someone puts on you like a oversized robe, okay? So it's like, you know, you're sitting down and it's just, you know, dangling all the way to the floor. And then you stand up. He says, you don't really notice the extra weight of the robe. When do you start noticing the extra weight of the robe that's like hanging off of you? It's when you start walking, right? When you start walking and all of a sudden you feel that you're dragging a lot of fabric behind you, that's when it becomes noticeable that, you're, uh, that there's a lot of extra weight. So he said, everything of this world is just holding on to us, asking to be uplifted. And, they're, and it's only noticeable when you start walking. 
when you actually start moving and coming closer to the Rabbanu Shalom, then you realize, well, I'm schlepping a lot of stuff with me. What are you schlepping? Everything of, of this world. And that feels like you're being attacked. It feels like you're being weighed down. But that's not what the extra material is trying to do. The extra material is not trying to weigh you down. It's trying to hitch a ride. That's what's happening. So whenever a Jew it, it feels like under attack from the Eight Sahara, you have to think of it in a different way. You're not under attack. The Eight Sahara is trying to, it, it's asking for help. Those experiences, those thoughts are asking for help. How do you help it? You help it by, by not getting distracted. And you help it by focusing more in your davening and focusing more in your learning. That's how you help those thoughts. But you're not, you're not fighting against them. That's what they're trying to do. When you're davening, for example, and uh, a thought comes, or even not a thought, let's say a person comes, right? Or, or things, things are going on that are distracting, right? Let's say there's a, you know, you're davening and there's like a fly, you know, going around the room. And uh, your mazel is that this fly is just going around your head. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'm doing this trying to dive in my head. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, I got this fly for what? Just a distraction. No, no, no. This fly wants to be part of your myriv. It wants to be part of your myriv. So again, I'm not saying not to try to shoot away. But if you can't shoot away and it's there, what are you supposed to do? So you're machazic yourself. You know what? I'm going to dive in and the fly is going to be part of my field. And I'm gonna fo- I'm gonna focus. And what the fly is really asking me to do is focus more. Dav and dav, just have me in mind. That's what the fly wants. And you do that, then you reveal that the dvar Hashem, that the Ma'ariv is connected to even flies. And then you know what's gonna happen? The fly will go away. There's so many stories like this from the great tzaddikim that that by the Rizal, this was like commonplace that he would give a shear. And while he was giving a shear, it was common, very common, that animals would come and sit by the shear. Birds and foxes, different things. And then the shear was over. Mo- more often than not, the animals would drop dead. It's like, well, is that going on? The answer is that these were neshamas. They needed a tikkun. And all their lives, they're just looking for that, you know, that opportunity to be mishtatev, to connect to the Devar Hashem. And when the Devar Hashem is revealed, and these animals and so on are connected to it, then they fulfill their tachlis, and they're able to be revealed, uh, which was that there was never a fox, it was just a neshama. You know, that's a tzaddikim mar. So that's by big tzaddikim, where you you'd actually see that, that after the shear's over, the crow's like, you know, just falls off the trees, you know? But people like us, it's not happening like that. But you should know that that is happening. We just don't see it, but it is happening. All the thoughts, all the distractions, all the flies, they, they're all just asking for help. They're, they just want to be mishtatif in your avayda. And therefore, your response is, Deepen your avayda, to deepen it. And by deepening it, Adarabha, you're being strengthened by all those, by all those, by all that uh, extra material. And uh, yeah, it means, just means you have to carry, uh, you have to push harder. Hashem should help us that all of the things that we experience as enemies should be revealed to be in truth. of Ezer Kenegdais. And Hashem should help, we should be zaycha, that that moment of Har Sinai, of that gilo, of Enum Avadai, should re- return and be in a, you know, and to be in that state of of, of constant uh, revelation, the Bishkal Tzadik Mehavimino Amen.